Hey there, friends. Dave Politis. Yeah, missing project. Copyrighted edition for our video channel. Huck, the executive producer, is in the library today. Oh, she's been such a good girl. Oh, yes, you have. Oh, scratch my head, Dad. Oh, Dad, you're a good girl. A good girl. She is so fluffy and clean and nice and a good girl. Okay. Well, we are on to a very, very strange case. One missing person's case. You're going to see very quickly that we've discussed similar cases in the past, but there's a lot of things that came forward this time that never came forward before. And it should should clarify how unusual these are. Now, the setting is Minneapolis, Minnesota. I passed through that city 30 times for a variety of reasons. Many times it was for Ben's hockey camps, hockey tournaments, etc. Uh, many times drove along the Mississippi River and many times up near Bemidji in northern Minnesota way up north I uh, was at the headwaters for the Mississippi River and as I've stated before I think the Mississippi is the UFO highway they we don't see them they don't see us that's how they move around. And if you look at the number of times that the U.S. Navy and other people have reported seeing these craft underwater moving at great speed, you start to understand that uh, they can be anywhere. So, without further ado, the case involves a young boy named Lester Delano. And Delano appears to be an Italian ancestry name. He was 20 months old when this happened on July 8th, 1932. Another peculiar, peculiar part of this is that these disappearances that we're going to explain all happened between like the 30s and the late 40s. As did a lot of the cases that we discuss and then they seem to stop. Very unusual. This happened July 8, 32 in Columbia Heights, Minnesota, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. His parents are Mr. and Mrs. Ray Delano. Now, Ray was a very hardworking pressman, and he worked for a printing company in downtown Minneapolis. They lived in a pretty rural area for the time, uh, north of Minneapolis, and even today, when I look at a map around the address, which was 971 41st Avenue, even now, there's still, it's 971 41st Avenue Northeast. Even now, there's some bogs and swamps pretty close to where this all happened. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Delano were married for five years when this incident happened. They had one child. They lived in a neighborhood where there were homes next to each other, but there were no fences. So everyone's backyard kind of went together. And the best I could determine is that there was nothing in the backyard, but further away there was a field and there was some swamp. Now, on July 8th at 11.50 a.m., Mrs. Delano goes out and checks on Lester and he's sitting on the back porch and he doesn't have shoes on and she says you wait right here I'll be right back a couple minutes later she comes back put shoes on he's happy he starts walking around she leaves for 10 minutes she comes back at noon or a couple minutes after and she can't find Lester now remember, it's open backyard, so she looks for a long way. She can't see him. She looks both ways. 
She thinks, well, maybe he went in the house. So she comes to the house, she starts searches the room, which is the right thing to do. Goes back out to the front yard, looks around. Doesn't see anybody, doesn't see anyone. But Lester was in close proximity to another 27 month old boy. And that boy was going in the house, so he wasn't, he wasn't a witness to what might have happened either. Well, she searches, can't find anything. And after about a half an hour, she calls the Columbia Heights Police Department. Now, even today, Columbia Heights Police doesn't have a lot of people. 27 men, that's their manpower, 27 officers. Pretty small for a police department. But back then, there were 1,200 homes in that community in 1932. So you could kind of feel that it was a very small department. But they responded and they decided that they were immediately going to do a yard to yard search. Appropriate. They don't find anything. Then they contact the neighbors. Ask to search their home. Don't find anything. Search the Delano home. Don't find anything. Now they're getting worried and at two o'clock they call Mr. Delano at his work and he says, I'm coming home. Well, at 3 p.m., they made a call for more police from surrounding jurisdictions. Minneapolis came, the sheriff came, and they started to decide that they were going to take this seriously. About 90% of these cases resolve themselves in a half an hour or one hour child's at a friend's home, lots of times child goes into their room, take a nap. It's sometimes they crawl under a bed. You just can't, you can't believe the circumstances that evolve from these type of cases. But 3 p.m. they call for more police, 5 p.m. they call for even more police. And by 5 p.m. the Columbia Heights community had heard what was happening and they turned out by the hundreds and the police and others decided that they would group together and search as a as grid patterns could be and one man kind of rose to the top he was the reverend for Mr. and Mrs. Delano. It was a man named Elmer Husett. He said he saw that there was organization that needed and it didn't seem like the police had the manpower to do it. So he took charge. He got out a map of the area, broke it up into quadrants. And he said, okay, you got this area from this street north, this street south, this area. You got this swamp, you got this field. He did a heck of a job. And he had at that point, on July 9th, he had upwards of 400 people he was organizing. A phenomenal job. Well, the search got underway, went on for 12 hours. The police interviewed all of the neighbors to the Duenos. And they kept going outwards, which they should have done. They did a good job there. And then they started to find kids. And they said, was there anybody unusual in the neighborhood, etc." On July 10th, the press started to come out with their first theories about what may be happening. And the police were already getting frustrated because they thought, they had just about everything covered. Well, the first theory their first theory was is that the boy was kidnapped for ransom. But that theory didn't hold a lot of water because the Delanos didn't have a lot and nobody had contacted them for a ransom. Then the second theory that made the paper was that Lester was kidnapped because he was a good looking boy. He was a good looking boy and somebody wanted a nice child. 
Okay, well. And then the third one. Third one was is that Lester worked his way around from his backyard to the front yard. And he was run over by a car. The person picked up the body, threw it in the car, and left and disposed of it later. Now that address I was telling you about. This is north of Minneapolis. Here's the Mississippi River. Well, son of a gun. It's not very far away. And then this is another place called Silver Lake. Just a few blocks away. And right in between those two big bodies of water is their house. Now, a lot of you don't like to think that water plays into this. Well, even right here, right next to it. This is the swamps that they're talking about in their search effort. Gotcha. Well, July 11th, the Minneapolis Police Department sent over three of their best bloodhounds to the Delano home. They came in the house, they went to Lester's room, they gave him some pieces that had his scent on it, and the handlers decided that before they did anything, they were going to go hide one of Lester's pillowcases half mile into the swamp, see if the dogs could find it. And this would tell them that if it was too disturbed or not. One at a time, each dog went out. Within five minutes, they found the pillowcase. And therein lies, to me, an important part of all of this work. When something is there, the dogs find it. But it has to be there to be found. And sometimes I know because there's so many times that dogs don't find anything, you tend to question whether they're really worthwhile. I'm telling you, dogs are the best. And these dogs were trained right. So they decide that what they're going to do, and they put this item into an area that they didn't think Lester was in. And it was an area in an opposite direction of where their primary search was located. So they let the dogs out into the backyard and the dogs one at a time go out into the swamp, go out into this other field, not where the item was, turn around, do a complete loop, come right back into the house. They didn't think much of that, as I wouldn't either. And then they put the second dog on it. Second dog. Almost the exact same route. Hmm. Okay, that could happen. Third one. <laughs> exactly the same thing. So how could that be? I thought about that for several hours yesterday and I can't quite get it. I can't quite get it. And then the newspaper out in Minneapolis covered the story with what was called a spiritual leader which really would have been just a psychic. And the psychic said that Lester was kidnapped by three women who secreted him in the swamp and that the boy was still alive. And they were going to hide him there until the search was over. Hmm. So he disappeared on the 8th and it's now the 11th and the spiritual leader is saying he's still alive. That's all that the spiritual advisor stated. But people were paying attention. Because the next day, the Minnesota National Guard was put on standby by the governor for the first couple hours. And then they were given approval for uh, a duty assignment to go into that swamp and search it shoulder to shoulder, looking for Lester. There's pictures on the Minnesota Star newspaper of these guys up to their waist, searching in the swamp, shoulder to shoulder, looking for a body. It's unbelievable how good they did. And they still had police on scene. 
and they had four to 500 people every day that were organized by the Reverend that were searching other areas. Well, the National Guard was, was told that they were gonna search at least two more days. So the 12th, they got done at about eight o'clock at night, they came out. The next day on July 13th, this story had huge press in the Minneapolis newspaper in the greater Minneapolis area. And a boy's parents heard the story because their son had told them that he had seen a boy in the playhouse and didn't think much about it on the day that Lester disappeared. Well, then the parents saw the news flashes and said, well, this might be related. Maybe you need to talk to the police. Police came and interviewed the boy. He's 13 years old. He said that at about noon on the day that Lester disappeared, he was about 100, 150 uh, feet from their home, walking between homes to go through a field to go to a friend's. When he walked by a playhouse that belonged to one of the homes, and he glanced over and there was a little boy inside the playhouse. He saw the picture and he goes, I'm, I'm like 99% sure that was Lester. Well, detectives went over, interviewed this boy inside, out, backwards, forwards. Now you're always thinking maybe he's a suspect. But uh, the boy said that he remembered looking at his watch and it was 1230. Well, that was the last confirmed sighting that anyone had of Lester. The police, after interviewing this boy, came back talked to Mrs. Delano and said, could this be possible? She goes, wow, possible. Do you know that Lester loved playing in that house? It was a neighbor boy that he had, he was friends with and they would always play in that playhouse. I just never thought about searching it. So that seems like that's pretty much a confirmed last sighting, 12.30 p.m on July 8th. Well, Mrs. Delano's feeling horrible now because she's blaming herself for not finding her son. And they send 200 more searchers out into the field and the swamps behind that area. And they send out the National Guard again into a different area because they'd already searched it. They found nothing and everyone's getting frustrated. Nobody knows quite what to do at this point. But the governor said that July 14th was the last day the National Guard was gonna be utilized. According to the officers in the guard, they didn't think that there was any place else left to search, but that they were gonna discuss devising a plan for the 14th that would search areas that were searched before at the beginning of the search and they were gonna go back and do those again. And the idea was do it with more intensity, brighter lights, focus minutely on areas. If there was anything that needed to be moved, they'd move it, etc. Good plan. 3 p.m. July 14th. National Guard are moving through an area 150 feet from the Delano home, a residence. And they come across behind the residence, a small wooden plug, a square, a square wooden plug sitting on the ground. They pick the plug up and they're looking down into a hole. And the hole's deep and it's just dark in there. One of the guys has a flashlight. Tie a rope to the flashlight, they let it down. And they're not sure, but they think they see a body down there. Well, they call over another witness who looks down and says, I think, that, I think that's a boy's body. They call over Mr. Mr. Delano and he says, it might be a doll, but it looks like my son's clothing. Well, make a long story short, they recover the body. 
and it is Lester. It's 10 feet to the bottom of the hole from where the plug was over the hole. But there's one huge problem. Huge, huge. Columbia Heights police and three officers had checked that same hole and lowered a light into it on July 10th, two days after Lester disappeared. There's a couple other huge, huge issues with this, which is why the story is in front of you, folks. Let me show you a picture. This is a picture, that's Lester. But see right here? That's the hole. The hole is essentially squared, eight inches by nine inches. This is where they looked down in and found him. The problem is, let me show you this picture again, he was a rather big boy. And the chances are that he didn't fit in that hole. And I wanted to bring this to you. That's eight inches right here. That is eight inches, folks. Sorry, that dog don't hunt. That boy did not go down that hole. And none of the police believed it. None of them. This was causing quite a stir in greater Minneapolis. They call this a dry cesspool. A couple days afterwards, police come up with a theory. Theory is Lester was not in that hole on July 10th when Columbia Heights searched it. They believed Lester was in the swamp. Swamp had a small flow that went into the main drain of the city. And that main drain in the city had little forks off of it that went to each home's cesspool. Their theory was, is that it got washed out of the swamp into the main drain. Main drain went down, it got big, it got heavy flow floated up and floated upstream to the cesspool? Upstream to the cesspool? That had to be a significant flow. But there's one big problem. Everybody who reported on finding Lester stated the cesspool was dry. Theory's no good. Theory's no good. So how did he get in that cesspool? He didn't crawl down into it. You and I couldn't have fit up the pipe that went into that cesspool. But it even gets more confusing. stated that Lester had only been dead for 24 hours. He was missing for six days. So for five days, he was alive. Oh, where? Well, if he was in the swamp, I guarantee the National Guard would have found him. But he wasn't there. If he was anywhere in the neighborhood, I guarantee people would have saw him, but nobody saw him. Now, from my own edification, I'd like to know what was in his stomach. You see, you and I, after three or four days of nothing to drink, we would die. Now, Lester was missing for five days, 20 months old. His system is much more susceptible to dying than us. 
Yet he lived five days. He had to have been given water or food. Now the coroner also never mentioned a cause of death. There was a definite lack of things mentioned about this case once it was shown that the hole was dry and that Lester couldn't fit down that hole. Now I'd also like to know where his knees scraped up, where his feet scraped up. Again, none of that was talked about. In cases of great mystery, this is exactly what happens. Even today, reporters just stop reporting. And this is the problem with today's society. There are no more investigative reporters willing to push the envelope to try to understand what's going on. Remember the family up in the Sierras that disappeared a husband, a wife, a dog, and a child, and they're all dead within a, a certain period of time. And the coroner stated that they, they all died together. Oh, what? Yeah. Everybody dies at different stages. We all just don't lay down and die together if we have hypothermia. It just doesn't happen. Everybody's system is different. Now, in Lester's case, for that boy to stay alive for five days is a phenomenal feat for anybody, considering how hot and humid it is in July in Minneapolis. Now, if, as they claim, Lester was ever in that swamp, why didn't the dogs find him? Why didn't the people find him? Remember, the canines went out and walked ran all the way around the swamp and came back. Strange. Now I'll go back to what that spiritual leader said, psychic said, back on July 11th, three days after he disappeared. She said that he was still alive and that three women secreted him in the swamp. Well, maybe that's why the police came up with this theory that he was washed into the main sewage system and then washed back upstream into this home. I, again, it doesn't make any sense. And I've had many of these cases where people are found, where small children are found in sewage tanks and things under conditions that don't make any sense. I have a very difficult time understanding what's happening my mind tends to go to something really evil, devilish, horrifically bad. Because when you think of Lester, I think of the, the most innocent of humans. At 20 months old, what could he do that is bad? At 20 months old, you're the epitome of innocence. How did that boy get inside that 8 inch by 9 inch square hole? Where was he for the prior six days? What was his cause of death? My guess is that starvation, lack of liquids. There was a reason that that wasn't released. And I wish I knew why. But this is one of those stories where it adds something in my mind. Something highly unusual happened to get that boy into that position. He didn't go in there voluntarily. He didn't fall in there. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. So, thank you for being here. How can I appreciate you watching? I appreciate it if you share it on your social media. And I can only imagine the grief that the Delanos felt after losing their child under these conditions. Horrific. 
horrific. One last thing. I talk about the kindness revolution. It doesn't cost us anything to be kind. Even to your most hated political rival, whoever that may be, I'd always smile and say, hey, how are you doing? It's their choice if they don't want to be nice. But it's your choice. You can be nice. Politis out.